Good day everyone. I welcome you to the ninth episode of Physics for SS2. And in this particular episode, we are going to be dealing with the measurement of heat energy. So I implore you to try to watch this video right to the end so you can gain as much as possible. Now you agree with me that for some episodes now we've been dealing with heat and you should be familiar with the concept of heat, which is basically the um the um the the measure of the internal energy of a substance whereas temperature is the measure of the average kinetic energy of the substance so that's different between heat and temperature now this heat energy is transferred always from a hot object to a cool object and then experiments show that the rise in temperature of a body is proportional to the quantity of heat supplied to the body and it's also proportional to the mass of the body and the nature of the substance of the body so in general we can write that the heat is equal to mc theta so we have heat where m is the m is the mass of the body h is the quantity of heat theta is the change in its temperature and c is a constant known as the specific heat capacity of the body now this constant is dependent on the nature of the body so for example we can define that the specific heat capacity of the body of a substance is the quantity of heat required to raise the temperature of a unit mass of the substance by one degree Celsius or one Kelvin. So that is what specific heat capacity of a substance is. Now here is a table showing the um, heat specific heat capacity of different substances. So you can see from aluminium to brass to copper. So you can see that of special um, importance here. You can see water at the bottom of the table, which is four thousand two hundred joules per Kelvin per. Per kilogram, and this shows that water has the highest heat capacity of all the substances on this table. And I will tell you the significance of that. What that means is that the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of water by one degree Celsius or one degree Kelvin is a very large amount, which is 4,200 joules for one kilogram of water. Now, what that means is that water has also has the ability to absorb a lot of water before you notice any temperature change that is why water is often used in factories and industries for cooling their water plants and their machinery so you can see that water is actually having a very important function that is quite um, not very common to most of us there are other terminologies related to um, heat and temperature of substance for example we have the thermal or heat capacity which is the quantity of heat required to raise the temperature of a body by one kelvin so when we talk about the heat capacity, it doesn't require us to talk about the mass of that body. All we need to know is the quantity of heat required to raise the temperature of any body by one Kelvin. Now the unit of thermal or heat capacity is joules per Kelvin, and it's easy to see that heat capacity is equal to the mass times specific heat capacity. So when you multiply the mass of a body by a specific heat capacity, you are going to get the heat capacity of that specific body. So H C theta is equal to C P theta. So here that C subscript P is the um, thermal capacity of that substance and the quantity of heat is equal to the thermal capacity times the temperature rise which, uh, which, which that um, body has been subjected to. Let's talk about a particular experiment that is used to um, calculate the measure the um, specific heat capacity of a solid by the electrical method. And this um, electrical method it involves boring two holes in a block and this block is a metal block. We are looking for the specific heat capacity of this metal block. You you um bore two holes in the block after which the block has been weighed. So after you bore the holes, you weigh the block, and then a thermometer and an electric heater are inserted in each of the holes. A little oil in each hole helps to establish a good thermal contact. So basically, the thermal the initial of the block is noted, and then the electrical heat heater is switched on. So after the coin is allowed to flow for some time, you will now measure the final temperature of the um the block after the temperature has risen by about 15 degrees Celsius, then the exact time of flow of a known current is measured with a stop clock, and the initial and final temperatures of the metal block are measured by the thermometer. So basically, by this using by knowing this information, you can calculate the um specific heat capacity by formula IVT equals M C theta. So in this case, IVT is the electrical work done, where I is the current, V is the voltage, and C is the time for that current to pass through the metal block then we also have mc theta mc theta is the um, is the is the heat that that current is converted to so when we manipulate the equation and change the subject we have c is equal to ivt over m theta 
so this is how to measure the specific heat capacity of a solid and this is known as the electrical method now, let's talk about another method of determining the specific heat capacity of a substance and in this case we're dealing with a liquid so we are making use of the electrical method this time around but to measure the specific heat capacity of a liquid now the apparatus for this experiment is as shown all you need to know is you need to have a plastic container where you weigh the um, the uh, the liquid and you fill that container about two thirds of the liquid then the ammeter the voltmeter and the heating coil are connected in the circuit as shown so as you can see in this diagram this is how they tell you have the electrical circuit then you connect the ammeter the voltmeter and then you connect them into this um, um this this um container which contains the liquid by fitting through holes in the wooden lid then when you switch on the currents you after you measure the initial temperature you switch on the current and just like the measurement of heat of the heat capacity of a solid you can also um, you can also leave, let the current flow for some time and then let it flow for about three minutes and after after that you switch it off then the liquid is um, should be stirred while heated and the um, the final temperature is read after the current is switched off and the specific heat capacity of the liquid is calculated by using the same formula but you, you need to know the final and initial temperatures you also need to know the mass of the um, of the um, liquid which could be water or whatever it is then you you should also know um, you should also know the the current the magnitude of the current the voltage and the time through which it passes through so in this case we are approximating it to be theory so when you manipulate that formula you be able to get the statement of the um, specific heat capacity of that substance oh, whereas we talked about a measurement of the specific heat capacity of a solid by electrical method in the previous example we can also measure the specific heat capacity of a solid by method of mixtures now this method of mixtures it is similar to the method of electrical um, 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 experiment but in this case we are going to make use of a slightly different apparatus so in this um, case you have to um, dip the solid into a uh, you have to dip the solid the solid should have an unknown heat capacity you dip the solid into a liquid or rather boiling water and then you also dip a thermometer into the into the liquid to give the initial temperature so when you measure the initial temperature you are going to um you weigh the um actually you have to weigh the solid you tie it to a string and then you dip it into a beaker of boiling water and the calorimeter together with the stirrer is first empty weight empty and then weighed when it's about two thirds full of water the initial temperature of the water is read with the thermometer after the solid has been stayed in the boiling water for about 15 minutes it is quickly transferred into the water in in, in the calorimeter so basically you transfer it from the boiling water to the calorimeter so at this case we we'll have to assume that the temperature of the um, of the solid is 100 degrees Celsius which is the temperature of boiling water now finally the calorimeter is covered with a lid and the water is gently stirred to ensure a uniform distribution of temperature then the highest temperature of the highest steady temperature of the mixture is read and then recorded finally the specific heat capacity of of the of the solid can be calculated using the fact that the mass the heat loss by solid will be equal to the least gained by water and the calorimeter and the stirrer so the reason is that this is a demonstration of the conservation of energy because in the calorimeter we are making the assumption that the heat the heat loss is very very little and negligible so that is why this we hold true so now let's deal with an example to help us understand the concept which we've been talking about so far now in this example we have that a piece of copper weighs 400 grams and is heated to 100 degrees Celsius and is then quickly transferred to a copper calorimeter of mass 10 grams containing 100 grams of a liquid of unknown specific heat capacity at 30 degrees Celsius now if the time final temperature of the mixture is 50 degrees Celsius calculate the specific heat capacity of the liquid now in this case we are told that the specific heat capacity of copper is 390 joules per kilogram per Kelvin now in this case all we need to do is you you need to know the mass of the copper which is 0.4 kilogram the mass of the copper calorimeter which is 0.01 kilogram the mass of the liquid which is 0.1 kilogram the initial temperature of the copper piece which is 100 kilo 100 degrees celsius the initial temperature of the liquid and calorimeter which is 30 degrees celsius and finally we also need to know the final temperature of the mixture which is 50 degrees celsius now you need to know the heat loss by the copper 
So you need to calculate the amount of heat loss by copper based on temperature difference, which is 7,800 joules. Finally, we also need to know the heat gain by the liquid, which is um, 2 times C. Because we don't know the um, heat capacity of the liquid. But we know the heat gain by the calorimeter. So that's 78 joules. So together, when we equate the heat gain to the heat loss, that means 2C plus 78 equals 7,800. When we solve that equation, we have the C as 3,861 joules per kilogram per Kelvin. So this is the heat capacity of the liquid in the calorimeter. So in this case, we have another case here. We have to um, determine the melting point of naphthalene. Now, this is how it's done. You have to put some solid naphthalene in the test tube, place it in the beaker of hot water, hot water. Then you insert the thermometer into the test tube and read the temperature of the melting naphthalene as one minute interval as the um, water into the beaker heated more and more. So basically, in this setup, you have a thermometer, you have a beaker, you have water, you have naphthalene. So as you heat it, more and more you put the thermometer measuring the temperature at intervals so when you measure at intervals you have a cooling curve like this when all the solid naphthalene has melted remove the beaker of hot water and allow the molten naphthalene to cool undisturbed and again as you record the temperature at one interval you you um you plot the graph of temperature versus time and in the cooling curve in the cooling in the cooling case you will have a curve like this so as it, as, it, as 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 temperatures goes down with time they will get to a stage whereby even as though the the um, as time is going on temperature is still not getting lower so that is basically how you know the melting point and that is how to determine a solid a, a pure substance so in any pure substance you have this flat line this flat line with with um, a zero gradient on the temperature curve temperature cooling curve so this is one way to recognize them and this demonstrates the fact that naphthalene is pure now just as our example of the cooling of um, heating and cooling of naphthalene demonstrates that means there is no temperature change for the um, heating and cooling at the melting and boiling points respectively now in this case we might want to ask where does the heat go when you when you um, cool a substance from its melting point and when it when it changes state so that's that um that heat that doesn't produce any temperature rise is called latent heat and it is used in breaking the bonds that um that um that that hold together the structures of that molecule and it's often common when whenever it involves the change of state. For example, whenever you want to change, whenever you melt ice, the the temperature of the ice begins to increase the, until it gets to a particular point at which the temperature no longer increases. And at this point, the, the ice begins to melt. So the temperature will not increase until that ice melts. When, the, when, when, when it's finished melting, when it's finished melting, it's finished melting for pure water, that would be um, 0 degrees Celsius. When it's finished melting, it, will not, it cannot increase to 1, 2, 3, and so on. Temperatures, scales. And now in this case, we call that latent heat. So let me define latent heat. Latent heat is the heat supplied or removed, which causes a change of state without a corresponding change in temperature. Now, latent heat is an invisible heat, so the so thermometer does not detect it. It depends on the mass and nature of a substance. There's one type of latent heat known as latent heat of fusion, which is called that because it is the quantity of heat required to convert a substance from a solid to a liquid state without a corresponding change in temperature. Now, when we are dealing with only a unit mass of the substance, we, it's called a, it's called a specific latent heat. Now, specifically, specific latent heat of fusion is the quantity of heat required to convert a unit mass of solid at melting point to its liquid without a change of temperature. Now, the ordinary sign of latent heat and of fusion, vaporization, and so on and so forth is very important for us to be able to understand heat and then its conversion and how different substances react to heat. Now, let's explore an example where we will determine the experiment of, of, of um, for determining the specific latent heat of fusion of ice. So in this case, even though that heat is hidden, we can also still determine it. Now the formula we'll use is that the H equals the ML. Here H is the um, heat, um, heat gives Y M is the mass of substance, Y L is the, is the specific latent heat of fusion. So in this case, the specific latent heat of fusion is the heat that is required when, whenever you want to um, convert a unit mass of solid to its liquid form. So it's called fusion. Now, basically, specific latent heat of fusion 
is um is 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 similar to um to when you want to melt the substance also now basically you have a copper calorimeter of the sterile and you first weigh it empty and then anyway when it's about half full is water so about five degrees celsius above room temperature then the exact temperature is read and recorded some small ice blocks are dried with blotting paper and then added to the water in the calorimeter the mixture is gently and continuously stirred each piece of the ice is allowed to melt completely before the next one when the temperature of the mixture is about five degrees below tem room temperature the exact tem temperature is read with the thermometer and then the calorimeter is which is content is weighed to find the mass of ice added so using this um, setup you can use it to calculate the um, specific latent heat of heat capacity of ice so by using the formula h equals m now let's talk about one um, effect of pressure and impurities on freezing point and this effect is known as regulation now let me explain how this happens when an ice block is seen to melt is because this there is a sufficient pressure applied to it so when you have an ice block on let's say a hard surface like a desk and then you 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 um, exert some pressure by 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 suspending some weights above the um, over the um, ice so you can see that there's a region of high pressure at that point where the weight is suspended with the string with the copper wire now when you use this copper wire to suspend that um that that um weight it's 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 it subjects the ice to a high pressure and when this but when this pressure is removed the ice will will, will refreeze so that's known as it's known as regulation because this regulation occurs because when you increase the pressure the ice um, actually f f melts but when you remove the pressure the ice refreezes so this phenomenon is it occurs because the ice directly below the melt the uh, the wire melts because the increased pressure lowers the melting point of ice here is the wire falls through the water formed above the wire the decrease in pressure raises the freezing point again and the wire and the water refreezes again so this occurs in cycles and so the water freezes refreezes freezes refreezes, and as such the weights will then will passing through the um, ice then it will, it will pass through the ice and it will get to the bottom of the ice with the ice still in one piece so this is the process of radiation and this ice works is a result of pressure and because of the fact that the pressure has been um the there is a direct relationship between the pressure and the temperature so as you increase the temperature as you increase the pressure you are increasing the temperature and as you increase the temperature you are melting the ice so when you decrease the pressure you are decreasing the temperature and the ice will then have enough time to freeze again so this height works now we've talked about um, the specific latent heat of um, fusion now let's talk about latent heat of vaporization but vaporization is a process in which a substance changes from liquid to the gaseous state and like fusion it occurs at a definite temperature so we can define it as the quantity of heat required to change a unit mass of substance from a liquid at boiling point to vapor without a change in temperature so and it's given by h equals ml capital letter l where l is the specific heat, latent heat of vaporization so basically um, this is how you calculate the specific latent heat of vibration vaporation the reason why we don't have change in change in temperature here is because there is no change in temperature as i mentioned earlier for latent heat you have no change in temperature now let's talk about an experimental setup that can be used to determine the specific latent heat of vaporization of steam now in this case you can find it by passing steam into water in a calorimeter where it condenses and releases its latent heat so the apparatus is shown so basically in this diagram all you need to do is you weigh the calorimeter as this is empty and then you weigh it half full with water then you then the temperature of the water is read and recorded then the calorimeter is lagged to insulate it from the heat of the surroundings and the steam from the boiler is passed through a steam trap to measure any um, sorry to remove any condensed um, moisture so you can see the steam trap is used for removing any moisture now basically the next thing you the next thing we'll do is um you the dry steam only passes through into the water calorimeter and a screen is usually placed between the boiler and the calorimeter and the reason for this um, screen is because it is um, to remove any condensed moisture so basically the dry steam only therefore passes um, through the boiler and calorimeter and 
it, it, it is used to prevent the litter from receiving heat directly from the boiler. So it is used to prevent the transfer of heat by convection and radiation. Now the pass, passing of um, drying steam into the carimeter is stopped when the temperature of the water rises by about 30 degrees Celsius. So using this setup, you can make use of the knowledge of the mass of the carimeter and so on and so forth to calculate the specific latent heat of operation of the steam. So this is the experiment for that calculation. To round off this video, we'll be talking about a collection of concepts which include the dew points and relative humidity. But before that, let's talk about um, other um, things that are related with um, temperature and those are evaporation. So I will define evaporation as a process whereby a liquid turns spontaneously into a vapor below its boiling point and it occurs molecules at the top of the, at the surface of the liquid have less forces binding them together. That is the reason for evaporation. Now, when we talk about evaporation, evaporation causes cooling because when we when evaporation occurs, the heat of that um, substance is being reduced. So from evaporation, we will um, consider the working principle of a, res a refrigerator. A refrigerator is a, is a device that that works on the principle of evaporation, whereby the um, the um, coolants are used to cool the the substance because when they evaporate, they actually um, lose heat. So basically, when they are brought in, in contact with the um, substance to be cooled in the refrigerating chamber, so they begin to um, they absorb the heat and then they um, actually condense. So the condensed liquid is is now is now circled back. It is um, it is circled back and compressed and so on and so forth. So this is the cycle of refrigeration. It works on the principle of evaporation. So next, let's talk about boiling. Boiling is basically similar to evaporation, but in this case, in boiling, the temperature of boiling occurs at the boiling point. Now, this is what leads us to the boiling point. Boiling point is the um, temp is a liquid is the temperature at which is saturated vapor pressure is equal to the atmospheric pressure. So, what is the saturated vapor pressure? It is the it is the vapor that is it is vapor pressure at which um, the vapor in contact with a liquid is. Um, Basically, that saturated vapor is a vapor that is in contact with its own liquid within a confined space. So basically, when we talk about saturated vapor pressure, it's a pressure at which there is no net change in the uh, movement of molecules from the liquid and the vapor above it. So that is when there is a saturation. So there is there's kind of like a dynamic equilibrium between the molecules entering the liquid and the molecules returning from it. So these are concepts uh, you need to understand before talking about relative humidity. So these are basically talking about the um, the phenomenon that gases uh, gases go through. So basically, relative humidity is the ratio of the mass of the water vapor present in a pres in a certain volume of air to the mass of water required to saturate it. So at the same temperature. Now, after understanding relative humidity, we can also go on to understand dew point. So dew point is the temperature at which water vapor present in the air is just sufficient to saturate it, and Another way of defining relative humidity is therefore related to dew point. So relative humidity can be defined as in terms of dew point and in terms of saturated vapor pressure. That is saturated vapor pressure at dew point divided by the saturated vapor pressure at the temperature times 100 percent. So this is this is a, this is the group of concepts that I need you to understand, and these are the remaining concepts that you understand in this video. If you don't have, if you have any issues understanding them, you can also reach out to the WhatsApp number in the description of this video. So thank you for watching, and I hope to see you next episode.